Well, good morning. We want to welcome you here to First Baptist Church uh, of Lloyd, and we want to thank you for joining us on this. Uh, it's sort of a holiday weekend. I heard a comment uh, like on Thursday, which I thought was kind of funny. If you want anything business related or stuff, nothing's going to get done till next Wednesday. It's like a, a holiday on a Tuesday, and we take the whole weekend off for it, even the Thursday, Fridays, Monday. So that what what a great holiday weekend we've got. So uh, hopefully you can enjoy it as well. <clears throat> and coming up this week, uh, but we are thankful that you're here. Remember when you do have uh, holidays, your own vacation time coming up and stuff, you can tune in again on the Facebook or YouTube, then see it again uh, later on the replay on YouTube and uh, watch it with us and be with us even though you're away and stuff. And that's always a special time to be able to do that. And um, don't forget on Wednesday, we will not have the services on what would be July 5th no Wednesday night services, but instead we want you to join us on July 4th if you have no other holiday, Independence Day, July 4th plans. And uh, um, again, Billy and Paulette are graciously hosting us down at the River House, that they call it, and uh, there are directions on how to get there, the items you need to bring. If you want to ride the church bus, it is leaving sharp at 11 a.m., so be here to ride the bus down and then ride the bus back some of us are driving down so we can leave at the uh, time we need to leave and for other events of the day and stuff. So come and join us for that. That's going to be a great day. Then July is all of the usual events. You know, sometimes we say, oh, we'll take the summer off. And other times we say, we're going to keep going with everything. So we've got Lift Ladies and Silver Saints and WW Diners. Uh, we're going to have the sing-along that we host here again uh, on, coming up on a, a July 16th Sunday evening. We're going to go ahead and share with dessert so we can get to know some of these folks from the other churches as well. So that'll be a great time. Men's Bible study. It looks like the uh, middle school has activities. The youth have some activities. The uh, college students, the 18 to 26 age, has a, a retreat coming up. So you get connected with all the people you need to connect with for all the events of July, and you will be blessed through those. So uh, let's uh, join together and thank God for this uh, wonderful country that that he has given us and blessed us with and, and, and given us the freedoms that we have in this country so that we can do this very thing, to worship him this morning. Father God, we come to you. We thank you again for the uh, celebration of our nation's uh, 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 birthday. It's Independence Day, July 4th. Lord, what that represents for our country. Lord, we thank you for those uh, uh, rights that were codified in the Constitution, and especially that important one that, that says we have the freedom of religion. And so we are exercising that freedom this morning by meeting here in this place, lifting up praises to you, and we thank you that we're able to do that. And Father God, we just uh, ask now that you uh, bless this month of July, Lord, all the activities, all the traveling, the vacations, the plannings, the getting ready for school, and the things that, that are to come. We thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning. As John said, welcome. Welcome to the First Baptist Church of Lloyd. We are going to sing... Start with, O oh, come to the altar. I hope you're ready to worship, because we are. And we just pray that we will have a blessed service this morning. So please stand as we sing, O oh, come to the altar. <laughs> to the end. 
singing. Does Jesus keep you think, singing? Do you ever find yourself during the week just singing a hymn or singing a praise? Well, this morning we're going to keep singing. Amen.
Good morning, everybody. Well, happy 4th of July weekend. On Tuesday, as you no doubt heard, we're all invited to go to the river. Now, if you want to contact me later, I'll tell you what my favorite desserts are. But nonetheless, bring whatever you want to do. You want to go fishing, you want to sit around, please do so. It's going to be a great time. Billy Paulette, thank you for allowing us to do this. It's going to be wonderful. So, having said that, since it's Sunday, I realize there, this is the day that many choose to worship the Lord. But it seems like they might be a little confused about the freedom they've been given. Not necessarily the freedom that the military might bring or the freedom maybe a politician may usher in through agreements, but rather the freedom that they're confused about seems to center around public worship. Or they're confused a little bit about how to worship God now that they have all this freedom. There's a fellow by the name of Bruce Ware. He wrote about it. He says, what is freedom? Freedom is not what our culture tells us it is. Freedom is not my deciding from the urges and longings of my sinful nature to do what I want, when I want to do it, how I want to do it, or with whom I want to do it with. See, according to the Bible, that's actually bondage, not freedom. Rather, true freedom is living as Jesus lived, for He is the freest human that has ever lived. In fact, He's the only free, fully free human being that not only has ever lived, but that one day explains to us that we will be set fully free when we always and only do what the will of God is. So what is freedom? Jesus says freedom is submitting. Submitting fully to the will of God. The words of God and the work that God calls us to do. I want to start that way by explaining what a huge burden it used to be thinking that all of these spiritual things in your lives and in my lives all had to rest on all our shoulders. But what a freedom it is to cast everything on Jesus. This morning, I'd like to make a pre-challenge. You ready? This is the, the challenge before the message begins. You ready? Instead of listening to this message and then going home thinking about all the things that you have to do, all the I's you have to dot, T's you have to cross, and places you have to go, rather this morning, I would like for you to think of the possibilities of what it'd be like to give God everything. And I would argue that it'll be the most free you've ever felt in your life. Having said that, let's go to the Lord in prayer and let's tackle chapter 14 of 1 Corinthians. Father in heaven, our hope this morning is that people experience the freedom you offer. Thank you for your forgiveness. Thank you for your love. There are many, though, God, that are sick and they're hurting. There are those that are heading into surgery and some are recovering from it. And I ask that you bring healing to their bodies. And I ask that you give energy to the caretakers. God, this nation is one that you brought about, and I for one and many others, we are glad to be Americans, and we thank you for that possibility of every day. I ask that you touch our leaders, and I ask that you bless our military with protection. And so thank you for the independence, but may we always be dependent upon you. We pray that in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, last week we started looking at understanding worship in public. Now, let's title it this way, Worship in Freedom. Here's the deal, let me catch you all up in case you're new. Over the last several weeks, some of you understood what I have meant when I shared that Wednesday night, not too long ago, I was teaching some of our college and young adults a Bible study that happens after our adult one. We were looking on the screens about these different ministers that were performing before their congregation. And it seemed like they were doing some really crazy things. Some of the ministers were shouting so loud, some were dancing, falling on the floor. Now, one lady on the screen, as I've said in the past, and I mentioned to some of you, she looked like she was swimming for some reason. And some of you have sent me some photos uh, that you might call memes. Some of you have sent me some videos of some people. And I can't figure this one out. Uh, I can't use them because I can't even understand what it was they were doing. But one of you sent me a picture of a minister riding a tricycle while wearing a raincoat. Now, I've used many an illustration in my life, and I can't figure that out. I could understand a raincoat with flood, and I could understand storms, but I don't get the tricep, so I couldn't do it. And actually, actually, that really summed up part of the experience of what was happening. 
is because, as I've said, when you're going into worship, when you're leading worship, when you're experiencing worship like we are, public and corporate, what we do matters. Now, I'm not just saying that because I'm the preacher. I'm telling you that because I'm one that has been changed by Jesus, and I hope many of you have been as well. But one thing I hope you'll always understand about worshiping here at First Baptist Lloyd is that we never want public worship to serve as a distraction to others and what God's doing in their lives. And I've said week after week, and I'm going to continue to do so, having babies in this room is never a distraction. If I can't hold your focus through a screaming baby, that's on me, not you. Okay, so let me understand how as we dive in. Chapter 14, 1 Corinthians. I found it interesting the night that we showed all this and all the conversation pieces that we've had among our young adults about these messages is they were commenting on the performance and not what the speaker said. When you leave this place, I hope as nicely as I might have been dressed that that's not the biggest discussion you have is the color of my shirt. Although I did try to do 4th of July. Thank you, everybody. But rather the context of the message that I gave. You see, as I was listening to the comments that our young folks were making, I got to just illustrate, shouldn't the context of everything you say, no matter where it is, be all that matters? Apparently, this is what Paul was writing on. Apparently, this is what the church at Corinth, they had some tendency for some of the Corinthians to lose control of themselves as they exercised these gifts. And Paul had to remind them, just because you can do something doesn't mean that you should. And so in chapter 14, verse 1, it says, Pursue love and desire spiritual gifts, especially that you may prophesy. So we mentioned that if you're passionate about spiritual gifts, at least desire the best ones. Paul said, I wish all of you could speak in tongues. And some of you might think, well, I don't. Is there something wrong with me? Not at all. This is why we look at scriptures verse by verse. And because in 1 Corinthians 1, it says that even if I could speak in the tongues of men and angels, but not have love, I've become a sounding brass, a clanging cymbal. In other words, even if you had the ability to speak to every man and every angel under the sun, is that really what's most important when it comes to worshiping our Father in heaven? If talking in to angels is not the most important, what is? Paul went on to say several verses in that prophecy was the best spiritual gift because it built up the church. The church was supposed to give listeners encouragement. We're supposed to give you edification, which is to urge you to do something for Christ. We're supposed to bring you some comfort in this crazy world that we have. And so Paul says if there's a ranking system, it's pretty simple. Prophecy is best. Interpretation comes next. Then speaking in tongues. And so some of you say, well, wait a minute. I've spoken in tongues or I have family and friends that have done it. Paul never devalued. He didn't deny the value of speaking in tongues to the speaker. But unless they're interpreted, they won't matter. They have no influence and no changes, which leads us to the part that I had said in verse 6. But now, brethren, if I come to you speaking with tongues, what shall I profit you unless I speak to you either by revelation or by knowledge, by prophesying or teaching? Our goal as believers is to be understood. You want to be understood in everything you say and everything you do. And we want all of you to grow in faith and in knowledge of the Holy One. So Paul says over and over in this chapter, and it's going to get even deeper in just a moment, is that unless there's an interpreter explaining what's happening, that the church is not edified, nobody can understand a word you say, and it won't matter if it comes from God or not. If you're not doing what He wants, it is a message of null and void. As communicators, we need to learn how to pray. That our message, our method, it's understood. And in verse 16, it says, Otherwise, if you bless with the Spirit, he who occupies the place of the uninformed, say, Amen. At the giving of things, since he doesn't understand what you say, our responsibility is to give something to people that they can say amen to. Now, Paul says, if you're new to learning about Jesus... These people are called uninformed, which means they're not either saved or they're uninformed. They're not educated and they're a child in their faith. The Bible says that we're supposed to be spirit led, not led by your spirit. And so Paul says this is where we ought to live. 
We ought to live and worship and talk amongst the Spirit. And so when he said that I should live a life that people amen to, that doesn't mean from a culture perspective. We live in the world, but we can't act like the world, and the world shouldn't amen you. But they should amen the things that you do from the biblical perspective, from the God of the Bible named Jesus. And so when you say amen, you know what it means, don't you? It means that you agree. You agree with the things they've said. You agree with the things they've done. And so we ought to live lives that people can understand from God's perspective and say, Amen. I agree with what you're doing. I want you to continue doing it. And so if you only talk the talk of angels, what good would it do? So let's understand things together. Paul is about to talk about one aspect of your spiritual life. And we should never allow this to be the only aspect of our spiritual life. Paul said from the last several verses, that the musician, the bugler, the everyday conversationalist cannot be understood unless you have an agreed upon language. So now we get to fun. Did I, did I catch everybody up? Listen, you got to admit, that was pretty fast, wasn't it? So here we go. Our goal is to build the church up. So I want you to look at verse 20. We're not supposed to build ourselves up. I realize that is probably the opposite of the American dream. That I came from nothing... And look at who we are. But the Bible says that we're better together and to build one another up. If you want to understand how important that is to the Lord, listen to what Paul said. Brethren, do not be children in understanding. However, in malice, in babes. Be babes, he says. But in understanding, be mature. In the law, it is written, with men of other tongues and other lips, I will speak to the people. And yet, for all that, they will not hear me, says the Lord. Therefore, tongues are for a sign. Not to those who believe, but unbelievers. But prophesying, it's not for unbelievers, but for those who believe. We need to learn how to use spiritual gifts and the spiritual gift of tongues correctly. So let's get on the same page right here and right now. It's time to grow up in the faith. I'm ready to use all my cliches. You ready? Either go home or go big. Did I say that wrong? How about let's go big or go home? We could be like Nike. Just do it. Whatever these expressions I'm going in, I'm telling you, it's time to stop playing around. It's time to go all in. Let's really go for it. So now that I've got that all of the way, regarding anger, it's real simple. Be a babe. The other day, I'm walking in the store, and this cute little baby was being just unbelievably reasonable calm quiet no big deal and i could think well that wasn't my kid and so all i sat well i was looking at stuff that i shouldn't have looked at called oreos and i'm looking at these things and this person's walking by and this other individual goes what a beautiful baby which by the way i i don't know if anybody ever says what an ugly baby i mean that just seems harsh so in this process i'm assuming was the mother she goes, thank you so much. Today is a good day. And I thought, I wonder what a bad day looks like. Well, about 20 minutes later, I think I found out. You could hear the babe all the way across the room. But here's the issue. This baby made a loud noise. But it offered no destruction. It didn't hurt the mom. It didn't hurt the people near. It didn't bother anything except noise. And this is what Paul mentions when it comes to anger and malice and wrath and things. You want to create a bunch of noise? Okay. But it's time for you to curtail your violence. It's time for you to watch the very actions that you make. And so if you need to be a babe in wrath and in malice and all the things in between, what you need to do is be a grown-up in understanding. You need to mature in both your faith and your methods in serving and worshiping Jesus. So don't be a child. Understand Jesus. I know that some people are natural skeptics when it comes to do anything with God. Some people are naturally drawn to faith and they want to know what God is and what He has done for them and how He created the world. But one of the things that both of these groups have in common is that many of them are looking for a sign that God is indeed real. They want proof. 
that God is helping them. And they want proof. And this proof is typically called a sign from the Bible. People want to believe there's something more than what they already know. So they go looking for the possibility called a sign. Many of you can attest to this. You'll say, if this is God's will, then this will happen. If this is not God's will, then this will happen. So in the interesting aspect, is the Bible will ask you a detailed question of, is this how you're called to live? Is this how you're supposed to live life? By the flip of a coin, essentially. You see, I would tell you that if you think that's how you're called to live, I want to tell you, you're actually called to live by faith. You're called to live by faith. But if you choose to live by a sign, then let me share with you about the sign of speaking in tongues so at least you'll understand it. Let's go back to the early church. As a nation, the Jews were always seeking a sign. And so Paul quoted Isaiah 28, 11, and 12. It was a reference to the Assyrian army that's about to invade. And they're about to take over. And this was an evidence of God's judgment on this nation. So let me say it in a different way. You ready? God is saying, I brought this strange tongue to you so that this foreign tongue, you would ask, what in the world is happening to us? A tongue was issued so that they would cry out to God, go, what is happening? This happens to us. I believe that every time I hear a foreign tongue, I always go, what'd they say? What'd they say? I'm just kind of curious. And I love certain accents, by the way. Mine's called Southern. I'm going to let that linger for a minute in case that came as news to you. And it gets worse when I get around people that don't have Southern accents. I say things like right and light. Do you all understand what that means? That's taking a right, and there's a light on. Okay, God, just making sure we're all on the same page with our language. But you see, church, God would rather speak in a clear language that everyone could understand. But see, their repeated sins made it impossible. In Genesis, there was just one language. Many of you know the story of the Tower of Babel. See, because of man's heart, the sin that resided in it, Their goal was to make a name for themselves. And God needed to humble them yet once again. So he caused confusion in multiple languages. And people at the time spread throughout the world and they developed cultures and countries. And over time, people forgot to bring the message of God, the creator who invented all these things and created all these things. And instead, they began to invent their own gods. But God is a God of grace and he's not done with people. And he wanted them to know that there's just one God in this world. There's just one Savior and that he still cared for them. So in the past, he had spoken through them through prophets and messengers and their own tongue. And they still wouldn't listen. We have story after story in the Old Testament where they would come explaining, repent, repent. Turn your hearts over to the Lord. And they ignored them completely. And so it must beg the question that since this message was so simple, that all we had to do was ask forgiveness to repent and turn our life. And so the nation of Israel did not want to do it. The other nations didn't want to do it either. How do you wake somebody up when they stop listening? Well, then you got to shake them. How do you make them rise up and pay attention? For all these years, they were ignoring the messages of God. So at Pentecost, for the very first time since Genesis 11, since all these other languages would people would ignore, God spoke to them in a language they could understand. He gave them all the same exact message in the same exact way, which is why Paul said this is a sign for an unbeliever. The Jews weren't believers. They were in town celebrating the Feast of Weeks and it was the 50th one called Pentecost. And so this miracle of tongues, it aroused their interest, but it never convicted their heart. You see, no one who speaks in tongues should ever say that a tongue was used to save somebody. A tongue can't save anybody because if they did, all of us would be speaking in tongues. But it's a message assigned to the unbeliever. But it took Peter's preaching. 
He preached in Aramaic, a language that everyone had agreed upon. And he brought them to a place of conviction and conversion. 3,000 people got saved and more and more were added each day. And so as we look at edifying the church, at building the church, we learn that in order for us to be stronger together, to grow not just in number but in faith, we need to help one another speak and understand God's word. For those of in faith, that have used speaking in tongues as a, as a sign that you're saved. It's false. That's not the evidence that you're saved. That's just the evidence of the Holy Spirit working in your life. Or the church, if somebody's visiting and they require you to speak in tongues for you to become a member. Well, anybody can make up a gibberish language. It takes the Holy Spirit to deliver a message. So listen to me, folks. Speaking in tongues is used to lead those who don't know Jesus to the cross. And then the message of the cross is presented. The Holy Spirit right then and right there brings conviction. And they take a step of faith. And they enter into a relationship with Jesus. Because of everything he did from the cross. Not everything you said in a foreign language. How are we doing so far? Everybody smile at me. At least let me know I'm on the right page and we understand. All right, here we go. Church, there's many out there today that will say, well, I don't speak in tongues in public. I, I do it in a private way. Well, the private use of a spiritual tongue may edify the user, but it'll never, never edify the church. See, Paul told us that we ought to be zealous in verse 12 to build up the church. There ought to be nothing more exciting in your life than when you see somebody either become saved or then next follow, and I would argue so significant, is that when someone who is saved has that light bulb moment where they finally go all in with the Lord, they finally say, I am there completely. I'm reading, I'm praying, I'm growing, my life is changing. I tell you, that is one of the most exciting things in life when they finally get it. Right, everybody? And so because of that, you're thinking, well, since speaking in tongues is a sign for non-believers, then let's just invite all the unsaved people that we know into the sanctuary. Then everybody ought to speak in tongues so that all these people can be saved from back, right, left, and front, and forward. Well, let's address that. You right, everybody? Here we go. Verse 23. If speaking in tongues does occur in worship, you have to have order. In 23, it says, Therefore, if the whole church comes together in one place, And all speak in tongues. And there comes in those who are uninformed or unbelievers. Will they not say that you're out of your mind? We're going to have some fun with this section of scripture. But if all prophesy, an unbeliever, an uninformed person comes in. He's convinced by all that he's convicted by all. And thus the secrets of the heart are revealed. So falling down on his face, he'll worship God and report that God is truly among you. Here it is. This is my final point. I have more, but we're going to save them for next time. Okay, everybody? Happy 4th of July. But this one point's a little bit lengthy. Stay with me. Here it goes. When it comes to worshiping in public, this is what I'm asking you. Don't you like that note out there? Don't be crazy. Be convincing. Now, I think some of you know what I mean by crazy, but we're going to go into detail. See, when people haven't met Jesus yet, and they come into a public time of worship, we want them to see us as different. Absolutely. But not crazy. See, what a sign that would be. When I enter into a public worship service and people are speaking all in kinds of different languages, speaking nonsense words, and then acting foolish, can you imagine, this is what Paul says, that this is what he actually witnessed at the church of Corinth? Remember my last week's statement about an orchestra warming up and how crazy that is? You ever been to a zoo and seen a flock of animals just all going crazy and you don't understand what they're saying and they get louder and louder? Any of y'all ever been to a daycare and all the kids are doing what they do? Many of you would go, peace out. I hope that really works out well for all of you individuals. It's crazy sounding. You can't make sense out of all that chaos, Paul says. And all the sounds occurring at one time instead of admiring it all makes me want to leave. Can you imagine what it would make an unbeliever want to go? I once took a youth group to a concert. 
It was at a church that we had never been to. It was a fun little concert. The concert was over, and the speaker got up, and he goes, it's now time to do some healing. And I thought, ooh, I wonder what he means. I should illustrate the fact that I was 19 years old, my first time as a youth pastor, and I didn't know what I was doing. Can I get an amen? Y'all didn't know me back then. All right, so here we go. We go to this service, and I'm completely overwhelmed. And all of a sudden, the speaker is on stage, and he shouts out some like thing, and he does something like this. And I look down the room, and this 13-year-old girl in my youth group was like, "Mm mm-mm. And this other guy in my youth group, he's big and bad and bold and all these things. And he goes, I ain't going up there. And I was like, what am I supposed to do? And so all the youth group, this just shows you how loyal a youth group can be. They all go, Jared, you go up there. (laughs) So I'm sitting there, and I'm thinking, you know, I think it's an appropriate time for us to go home. And so I said, hey, guys, and I know that many of you who have gotten to know me would actually believe this because this did happen. I said, how about let's just go to Dairy Queen? And all of them were like, Jesus is a Dairy Queen. And so we took off. Now, one of my volunteers, one of my chaperones, they had driven separate. They stayed. And afterward, they gave me a full report. And she explained to me it was the most bizarre situation and that people were absolutely beside themselves and I said well did you have a wonderful moment and she described this whole thing for us she said it was so bizarre that all she could think is I don't belong now this is a lady who has trusted in Jesus for all these years that's not what a church is supposed to make you appreciate whether it's your first Sunday or your hundredth We want to welcome you into God's house, God's way. Not Jared's way and not anybody else's, but the way of God's word. And so because of that, if I saw that as a believer, knowing that I would leave, how much more would a non-believer leave, Paul says? See, that's the truth of an unsaved person, is that they would probably be so scared or so uncomfortable that they would actually leave prior to the interpretation of God's word and the explanation of what was occurring. So how does the spiritual gift of tongues work in our services? Well, since they cannot and will not save you, otherwise God would have told us we all needed to, we need to realize that because it's a sign for the lost, we ought to do what Billy Graham says. I love what Billy Graham used to say. He said, people won't know they need a Savior until they know they're lost. Did you know that it's possible to be raised in a Christian home? To go to a Christian church all your life? To say things out loud? To eat the food at fellowship times? It's possible to take the Lord's Supper. It's possible to listen to sermon after sermon and read the Bible all the time and still not know who Jesus is. Without the step of faith saying, you are my God and I'm asking you to forgive me and make me brand new. Without declaring that he's your one and only, what is it that you're really about? You see, in the marketplace, if you're at work or at school and a foreign language is spoken, perhaps you've wondered what that individual says and because in public worship services, we know people want to know what we're saying. The Bible says that if a tongue is used and is spoken, it is spoken to non-believers. And so that's where I hope that an individual who speaks in a foreign tongue, when their message was translated, not by them, and we'll learn that next week, that they will explain to all the non-believers, this is the message of God, that you need forgiveness. And that because you have committed sins, there is one Jesus. He gave his life for you on a cross, and he wants to forgive you. Do you want it today? You see, I hope they said, because Jesus really is real, and that they've been searching for gods in other areas, and that's the reason it hasn't worked. That Jesus will save them, all they have to do is ask. See, in our public worship services, we have many different believers here today that were raised in different faiths, and we have learned 
that when you use spiritual gifts appropriately at the right time in the right place, that it'll lead to the worship of God and people will see God at work. You see, that's our desire today is that we hope you came and you had an experience with the Lord, not an experience with just something. As worshipers of God, we hope that we will lead you to a place where your heart's open. So I've got to ask you, is your heart open today? Or did you come in with that huge wall built around it going, I've trusted enough people, I'm not going any further. Did you come into this place wounded and so your heart is beating just enough? We want to invite you to open your heart to the Lord this morning. The reason is, is we want you to truly experience God. We want you to see Jesus in us. We want to show you that we didn't put our lives together, but instead we brought our lives to Jesus and he sorted everything out for us. This is why we teach in the gift of prophecy. We teach the ability to understand the word of God and the calls that he makes on our lives. And because we don't want you to see us as crazy, we don't want to do all these public signs that scare you off. We want to convince you that there really is a Jesus and he's really living among us. And so he has called us to spend eternity with him. And we want to invite you to come along. This is why... We don't emphasize speaking in tongues in public worship services. But we do emphasize the building up the church. I need a few more minutes of your time. You got it? I'm not chasing a rabbit. I promise it all fits together. So it goes like this. We want to emphasize edifying you, which is called the church. For those of you maybe new, the church is not a building it's a group of people see you can raise many a building but a building never changed anybody but lives have been changed by Jesus and God uses us to do it we want to exhort you in the name of Christ and we want to urge you to do something to follow him more closely and so this is why we try to speak comfort together we know and understand how hard life can be it isn't our job to tell you how bad the environment is or how bad politics can be or how bad the economy is. Do you really need that lesson from somebody like me? You hear it enough, don't you? What you need to hear is that our nation's problems can't be solved by those who created them. But our lives can be changed by the God who created you. And so let's close this section out by using the gift of prophecy. I want to edify the church. I want my life to be an amen, and I want yours too. See, I want to share with you a, a brief testimony and convince you of the truth of God's word, but I want to do it through a parable. In Matthew 25, there's a parable of the talents. See, in this room, many of you have talents, and I don't want our Christian lives to be a, a talent where we live in public view of people and we're the really good people, but behind closed doors, we're awful. I don't want your life to be a performance. I want your life to be one that people look at and they want to be like because you want to be like Jesus. So when Jesus was speaking through the parables, he spoke of one that examined the servants that were given talents. The first two servants that Jesus spoke of, the Lord of the parable gave talents that measured seven. To one he gave five, to the other he gave two. Both of them doubled the investment for the Lord. And when they reported the good news, his reply was simple in verse 21 and 23. His Lord said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a few things. I'll make you a ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. See, the Lord said the same thing to both because both of them took what God had and doubled it, not just because of the importance of that, but rather they did things that he wanted them to do. However, there was one more servant in the parable who was given just one talent. Instead of investing his talent into anything, he rather, he hid it, hoping in fear that he wouldn't have to live with a possible loss. 
when the Lord arrived and came to him, the Lord wasn't pleased. In fact, his reply was quite different. In verse 26, the Lord answered and said to him, You wicked and lazy servant, you knew that I reap where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered seeds, so you ought to have deposited my money with bankers. And at my coming, I would have received back my own with interest. So take the talent from him, give it to him who has ta- ten talents. For to everyone who has, more will be given, and he has an abundance but from him who does not have, everything he has will be taken away and cast unprofitable into outer darkness. There'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So perhaps what I'm saying now is just as much a foreign language to some. You see, like Paul's message at Corinth, God has given us many gifts. He's given us many abilities. The gifts of the Holy Spirit only come from the Holy Spirit and how we use them is a perfect indicator of our dependence upon him and so i want us to be mature in the faith this morning speaking in tongues is just one of the gifts of the spirit and while paul never opposes the speaking in tongues he did try to put it in the right perspective you ready it's not the quantity of your words it's the quality of what you just said And I think that many of you today are sitting here going, I wish I had what I said back. I wish I hadn't have said what I had said. I wish I had an opportunity to say it differently. So listen to me, everybody. It's not too late, despite what they tell you. You can still ask for forgiveness. You can still ask forgiveness from God, and you can still ask forgiveness from your neighbor. It's up to them whether they forgive you, but that'll be between them and the Lord, not between them, the Lord, and you. You have one possibility this morning, is that God has given you a talent, and what you decide to do with it is what will matter. And so I've got to encourage you this morning. I've got to build you up a little bit. You ready? God wouldn't have given you a talent if he didn't want you to use it. And so for all of you sitting here today going, I'm not worthy, I've, been, I've done all these bad things, I'm a terrible individual, what would you like? Do you want us to agree with you? Fine, we agree with you. You're awful. But God wouldn't have given it to you if he didn't love you and want you to use it for him. So what are you going to do today? The next part is, I've got to urge you, what are the possibilities of you using the very things that God has given you? What are you lacking? Did you become so good at building walls around your heart and in your mind that you've done every single thing possible, including keeping out God's will? I want to tell you an important message. You ready? It's not too late. It doesn't matter whether you're a young individual or old. It's not too late if you're still drawing a breath to actually say to Jesus, I want to matter. I want to do something. What is it you want? And then when he tells you, just do it. Today, church, I want you to experience the gift of prophecy. There was a young man, and I'll use a little more of this next time. There was a young man. When he had entered into a relationship with God, he kept telling God all that he was going to do for him. He would go to the altar and he would say, God, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do this, and I'm going to do this. Except here's the problem. He was never really satisfied. He was always upset because everything he wanted to do for God, either it didn't work or it just didn't feel as good as he thought it would. And so he went to the old preacher and he said, I don't understand. I've given all this stuff to God. I've just just come to him and I keep telling him I'll do all this and do all this. And he goes, it's so simple, and I don't want you to miss it. He says, take out this slip of paper. And so he grabs this slip of paper, and he goes, now sign it. And so the young man signed it. And he said, why don't you just take it to the altar and see what God does with it? And so the young man, he goes to the altar, and he goes, Lord, I don't even know what I'm supposed to do, but here it is, completely blank. And then all of a sudden he goes, fill it however you want to fill it. And this huge weight just came right off his shoulders. This huge burden just lifted from his heart. And within that, he 
finally made the connection that he had been looking to make. And so this morning, we have all kinds of freedom. And for those of you who do speak in tongues, may God bless you, but I hope it's a message that says Jesus is the only one who can forgive. Because right here now, we have the fully inspired word of God. There's nothing new you'll tell us. But for all of us this morning, we want you to see Jesus in us. And so here's my closing testimony. Years ago, I thought I had learned about forgiveness. I'd preached on forgiveness. I had talked to people about forgiveness. But I realized very carefully and very quickly how easy it is for believers, for believers to hold on to grudges. I think we end up doing that even, even just on accident. Do y'all catch my drift? And so one day I was at a worship service and they were talking about forgiveness and grace. And one by one, I kept going through all the things in my life that God had forgiven me about. And one by one, I kept thinking about all this forgiveness. And then right then and there, the Holy Spirit said, but have you forgiven them? And I must confess to you that I broke. I, I'm an emotional guy in the fact that I like to laugh real loud, but I like to keep my tears to myself. And maybe many of you are like that. and Maybe many of you are more expressive. But I broke. I broke and I sat there. And I just let all this burden fall off of me. And I offered forgiveness to all. And I was forgiven for all. And so this morning, I want to tell you, I'm as free as I've ever been because I asked God for His forgiveness and I forgave others. So would you join me today? Can I, can I build you up and say you can do it? You can actually forgive that loved one. You can actually forgive that person that you have just held on to such anger over. You can forgive that spouse, that child, that grandchild. You can forgive that boss. You can forgive that school chum. Whatever it is, you can do it. I promise you because you can do it with God's help. How much has God forgiven you? And so I want to urge you, in just a minute we're going to sing a song. Maybe you need to come forward at the altar and just bring a blank sheet of paper and just say, here I am, an open book. Fill it how you want to. Or maybe this morning, what you need to be urged to do is you need to pray for somebody. I've got a family member, a friend, and they're just eaten up with bitterness, and they're eaten up with the past sins of their lives, and I want them to experience freedom. So maybe you need to come to the altar this morning and say, I want them to be free. God, free them up. Or maybe today you're visiting and this is the first time you've heard that Jesus loves you no matter what. But he loves you too much to leave you the way he found you. And so this morning as we sing a song, maybe you come up and you say, I want to meet this Jesus. And I want my life to be forever changed by his blood. So would you join us this morning? And for those of you who need comfort, if you need somebody near you to just hug your neck, shake your hand, to say, with God's help, it's going to be fine. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we love you. And our prayer this morning is rather simple. Forgive us for our sins and let us show who you are to everyone in this room. For God, you are here among us and we thank you for your grace, your love your forgiveness. We pray that in the name of Jesus. Amen. Would you stand? Would you come?
and come to the altar all week. It doesn't just have to be today. Your altar is where you go to worship the Lord. This is a special one indeed, but you can come to the altar anytime. Maybe over the next couple of days, you need to learn more about freedom. On Tuesday, we're going to go to a river. And down there, there's going to be food, and there's going to be fellowship, and there's plenty of conversation to be had. And so perhaps you come to the river thinking one thing, but in reality, you want an opportunity to start life anew. So when you go home today, for those of you who know Jesus, go home and celebrate this freedom. Worship. Go to the altar. Call a loved one you haven't talked to in a while and just say, look, it's as simple as this. I love you and I miss you. I just wanted you to know. See what God does with it. And so may you grow in maturity and live in for Him. Now, that's Tuesday. On Wednesday, John will be speaking to you. I'm just kidding. We don't have anything Wednesday. I was just making sure y'all knew. <laughs> On Wednesday, don't forget, we don't have services. No children, no youth, no adults, because we'll be doing all the things on the 4th. But on Sunday... I've got a special treat for you. Chris Tootin will be preaching our message on Sunday. You're in for a fun experience. It'll be a great job, and he's going to do a wonderful moment. So please come. Uh, next Wednesday after that, John will be addressing the, uh, uh, the older adults, and uh, Cody will be teaching our young adults. And so stay tuned. I'll be back on the 16th where we have our, our hymn sing. I'll be in the pulpit that morning, and then we'll have a hymn and all kinds of other things. So please come and enjoy. There is lots of things. And just FYI, uh, many of you remember Sean McMahon. That was the interim. When the young adult group and I go out of town at the end of the month, he'll be delivering the message that day. And so you're in for a fun uh, treat this month. You only have to hear Jared like one or two more times. So it'll be a great time together. May God bless you. Happy 4th, everybody. And just enjoy the day God's given. Let's close in our time of prayer. Lord, we love you. We praise you and we worship you. And may we live in the freedom you've offered us by doing your will. We pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Goodbye, everybody.